Good evening. Um, welcome to the 105th session of the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group. And tonight we're going to finish up talking about the Cirrus of Provorst. But before I start to do that, I want to uh, give us a little bit of time for some of our regular members to join us. Uh, I hope everyone had a nice Thanksgiving holiday, and I certainly did. I traveled uh, to visit my eldest daughter, and my other two daughters joined us, and um, we had a terrific time with the nine grandchildren. Uh, I found that I can defeat a nine-year-old in chess, <laughs> but only just barely. I beat him twice, and uh, he was going to crush me the third time, but he insisted on crushing me, and so he didn't take the obvious checkmate, and therefore he got himself into a stalemate and couldn't win. And so, anyway, we know what to get our grandchildren for Christmas, <laughs> at least those two guys. Uh, they're tough. And so, anyway, uh, this evening I'm going to start with uh, two brief readings uh, that were provided to me by Louis LaFontaine from the Carl Jung Depth Psychology site blog. And he mailed this one out to me. And... Um, it's entitled, The Collective Man is Subhuman. And it's a letter to Dr. Ed Lachenauer, dated 16 January 1940. What the public still doesn't know and can't get into its head is that the collective man is subhuman, nothing but a beast man, as was clearly demonstrated by the exquisite bestiality of the young German fighters during the Blitzkrieg in Poland. Any organization in which the voice of the individual is no longer heard is in danger of degenerating into a subhuman monster. And with kind regards, yours sincerely, C.G. Jung, from Letters, Volume 1, page 282. And so that goes with Dr. Jung's oft-repeated quote that if you take a hundred admirable persons into a room, you end up with one blockhead. And the reason for that is the people don't speak up. So um, I urge you to speak up and... Uh, and express your individuality in the course of this session. Okay. So the next one is uh, also from Lewis, uh, from the Carl Jung Depth Psychology site.blog, and it's called Carl Jung's response to a question about the relation between symbolic and rational conceptual thinking. And so I think that you would want to think in terms of the logos and eros. Good evening, Gray. Thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs> and I, thank goodness. Okay. And uh, let's see. I just wanted to mention um, a couple of books that I've been reading. Uh, one is The Wisdom of the Psyche. Let's see, can I get that not to shine? Okay, there we go. The Wisdom of the Psyche by Anne Belford Ulanoff. It's a terrific book. And it had about a quarter of it is dedicated to. Um, Women's Wiles, and a quarter of it is uh, dedicated to The Devil's Trick. And so it's uh, very interesting. And I just got today um, The Living God and the 
and our living psyche. Uh, and it's what Christians can learn from Carl Jung. And uh, again, it's by Ann Belford Ulanoff. So I urge you to take a look at those two books. And the first one I got uh, was uh, a used book, so you can get them quite inexpensively. Um, Thomas says, it reminds me of the feeling I get in poetry workshops, six or eight people working on another person's poem. A <laughs> committee does not a great poem create. Individuals with all their faults do. <laughs> yes, that's quite so. <laughs> and uh, anyway, and uh, Thomas says he's enjoying uh, Anne's, Anne Belford Ulanoff's work, um, Dr. Ulanoff. And good evening, our Aurora. Good evening, my friend from Norway. Hello. Um, okay, so anyway, this one is about Logos and Eros. And uh, I'm going to just read this meme off first. The meme says, the collective unconscious, so far as we can say anything about it at all, appears to consist of mythological motifs or primordial images, for which reason the myths of all nations are its real exponents. In fact, the whole of mythology could be taken as a sort of projection of the collective unconscious of humanity as a whole, obvious, obviously. Okay, so this is uh, Carl Jung's response to a question about the relation between symbolic and rational conceptual thinking and to what extent the loss of the former during the Middle Ages was responsible for the alienation of scientific thought from a more general humanistic approach. To B. Milt, M I L T, and this is dated 8 June 1942. Your questions are not easy to answer as they touch on territory, which for all the work of historical specialists still remains very much in the dark, probably because, as you quite rightly remarked, the Western mind has deviated in a particular direction from its original basis. Paracelsus, it seems to me, is one of the most outstanding exponents of a spiritual movement which sought to reverse this turning away from our psychic origins as a result of scholasticism and Aristotelianism. One can, with a good conscience, be in some doubt whether Paracelsus still remained in the origins or whether he got stuck in them again. The object-orientedness of the Western mind, as I am accustomed to call it, makes us, makes us forget that all knowledge is subjectively, that is, psychically, conditioned. This trend manifesting itself first in the Church in the form of Platonism and Augustinianism succumbed to Aristotelianism. The Arabs were, in a sense, responsible for this development because, through their transmission of Aristotle, they threatened the Platonism of the Church. As we know, it was Thomas Aquinas who effectively parried this growing danger from the Arab side. In my view, however, it would be wrong to overestimate the philosophical importance of the Arabs. They were in the main faithful transmitters and handed down to the Middle Ages not only Aristotle, but also a lot of Neoplatonic and Neopythagorean influences, which became the roots of Western science. By this I mean alchemy in the first place. The quintessence of Hermetic philosophy is a classical feeling for nature and is pagan par excellence. This Lumen Naturae was bound to appear obnoxious to the Church, for which reason the philosophical tendency in alchemy did not visibly break through until about the 14th century. The parallel development in China 
is instructive in that alchemy was there allied with Taoism and in the first centuries after Christ was pressed back by Confucianism along with Taoism and its ancient sources. But in keeping with the great tolerance in China, alchemy resumed its philosophical flights perhaps in the 8th century and put forth blossoms such as the secret of the golden flower which Richard Wilhelm brought out with my collaboration. Confucianism could in a sense be compared with the Aristotelianism of the church. The symbol-laden obscurant, the symbol-laden, the symbol-laden obscurantism of our medieval alchemy, which strikes us as almost pathological, was due not least to the necessity of dis of disguising the paganism of the alchemists' views because of the mortal danger of falling foul of the Holy Inquisition. Since the essential source of knowledge in Hermetic philosophy was the Lumen Naturae, or individual revelation, it is altogether understandable that the revelation administered by the Church could not tolerate a second one. Consequently, those deep springs bubbling up from nature, i.e. from the depths of the psyche, were largely blocked and the psychic component of our cognitive processes was excluded from the purview of consciousness. As I, as I have had the good fortune to go more closely into the psychology of Orientals, it has become clear to me that anything like a question of the unconscious is quite noto is a quite notorious question for for us simply I'll start that again it has become clear to me that anything like a question of the unconscious a quite notorious question for us simply doesn't exist for these people in the case of the Indians and Chinese, for instance, it is overwhelmingly clear that their whole spiritual attitude is based on what with us is profoundly unconscious. It was therefore left for psychopathology rather than, say, theology, to discover a quite substantial portion of our psyche has disappeared to wit the so-called unconscious. So it is not in the least surprising, but actually certain on a priori grounds, that we should find the nearest analogy to our unconscious in alchemy and hermetic philosophy. And all we have really done today is unwittingly to take up again the spiritual quest whose exponent, among many others, was Paracelsus. Our Western intellectualistic and rationalistic attitude has gradually become a sickness causing disturbances of the psychic equilibrium to an extent that can hardly be estimated at present. If you like to call the attitude of Paracelsus experimental, then the result of the experiment was that he got the practical outcome of the Church's Aristotelianism, namely the, objectif namely the objectification of nature really going. As to the other side of him, one can safely say it was not a success. The adversities of his time saw to it that he remained stuck in occultism, thanks to the fact that that age had as little a conception of psychology as Catholic philosophy has today. The psyche as an object of scientific study had still to be discovered. I don't know whether I have answered your questions adequately, but you know as well as I do how complicated the far reaching how complicated and far reaching are the factors that have to be considered. With collegial regards, yours sincerely, C. G. Jung. That's from Carl Jung Letters, Volume One, pages three sixteen to three eighteen. So here we all are. And uh, now we can talk, talk about the series of Prevorst. Um, and Grace says, she is awesome, uh, talking about Ann Belford Ulanoff. There is a Library of Congress 
video on YouTube over the Red Book. She speaks at the end. She's really a brilliant thinker, and and yes, she is. And uh, uh, she's just making me go ah uh, <laughs> as I'm reading her work this week. My goodness. Um, and so I guess I better get my cirrus back up here just briefly. Okay, so we're going to talk about this woman, the Cirrus of Provorst, and this is from a Gabriel von Mox painting from 1892, which is in the Prague Museum, so it seems, uh, at least so I'm told. Now, tonight, um, I'm going to go into a very much more complicated uh, discussion of what the Cirrus was seeing. And so I'm going to give you this image. And in the course of her um, seances with Dr. Jacobus Kerner, uh, she described these multiple circles, which is obviously a, it's a mandala, and uh, Dr. Jung described this a couple of different times. And just uh, to remind you, let me come back to that in a minute. I just want to remind you that I'm referring to the History of Modern Psychology by C.G. Jung, which is volume one of lectures delivered at ETH Zurich, which is the Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. ETH is the abbreviation, and these uh, lectures he gave, 16 lectures, are from 1933 and 1934. Uh, the thing that I like about this book is that it has some very long descriptions in footnotes of um, different other philosophers just to put them into context. So, for example, the page that I had opened to randomly, it's uh, there's a very long footnote about 12 lines on Joseph Priestley. And then the next one is about Thomas Reed, another on William Hamilton, and another on Rudyard Kipling, among many others. So it's uh, worth taking a look at. Um, and I'm just referring to some specific uh, parts in five of the lectures, five of the 16 lectures, Dr. Young referred to the Cirrus, uh, excuse me, Dr. Young referred to the Cirrus of Provorst. And so he wanted to, uh, in one of these lectures, um, discuss this. Um, which is um, a mandala which she described seeing uh, with Dr. Kerner. And so I'm just going to read out a portion of what he said in his lecture about this. And mind you, uh, for some reason, when he refers to some of these rings, he uh, reverses the location of them. And so, for example, uh, in this image, we have uh, NW at the top, which should be referring to Northwest, but obviously it is entered in the Northeastern quadrant. So it's not very clear. And uh, the editors of this book uh, said that it, the notes were very bad on this topic, especially about this image. So they were very confused. But anyway, I'm going to read what he said. In the last lecture, we considered the Cirrus's vision of several spheres. Let me give you a summary. The outer circle is the sun sphere, which she describes thus, quote, the ring has 12 parts, and in it I see the main impressions of what occurred to me at that time. This circle, unquote, this circle 
The circle simultaneously denotes the year and symbolizes the entire world. Now, imagine the so-called life sphere lying closely superimposed thereupon. It is divided into 13 and 3 quarters parts according to the lunar cycle. From it emanate the radiuses, which are actually not radiuses because the lines go tangentially to the innermost circle. And darned if I could find it. I couldn't really see in this circle where the 13 and 3 quarters divisions are, which represent the lunar cycle. So, so the, um, the, third, the second circle inward is the lunar cycle, based on the lunar cycle. And the first circle is the sun cycle, so that's based on the months. But anyway, maybe somebody else can see it. <laughs> okay, the three inner circles are starting from the center. Um, one, the solar center, the innermost small circle radiates like a sun. Two, the moon circle. Three, the seven starred star, the seven starred star circle. Seven is not necessarily an arithmetic is not necessarily an arithmetical term, but rather it represents a quality. Then comes the circle of the souls of animals, or the dream ring. Evidently, she assumes that a certain identity exists between the nature of the dream and the nature of the animal soul. Kerner reports the words of the seeress, quote, under this ring, I feel five other such rings, and above it, an empty one. The circles are thus layered, as it were. Uh, now, let me just mention that this, in this uh, perspective, you're basically looking down on a layered wedding cake. And that's what Dr. Jung means, I think, that each of these circles is layered one on top of another. And I think that's how he means for it to be oriented. So anyway, he says, regarding the sun sphere, she says, quote, the real bright day and the people lie for me outside the great ring, and I see more or fewer of them in the various sections. I prefer to represent these people as check marks. I feel the spirit of all people with whom I associated, but, but I do not feel or know anything of their body, their name, etc. Likewise, she said to me, I cannot think of you as a man or as a body of you least of all. I always feel you as a blue flame going around and around the outer ring, together with your wife in the same ring but she is in human form and more to the outside." Unquote. Characteristically, she has no corporal conception of man, but an ideational one. She disavows the corporeality corpor of man and, in accordance with her overall attitude, ascribes reality solely to what lies within. In so doing, she depotentiates the outer world and the inner world thus assumes reality. Quote, this outer ring with the blue flame circling around it is like a wall to me through which nothing can reach me. I myself am in the ring. When I imagine myself outside of this ring, I feel terrible and get scared. When I imagine myself to be free within the circle, however, I get kind of homesick. Unquote. <clears throat> She identifies the outer orbit with Justinus Kerner. His blue flame is moving there. These two act like a wall. Kerner serves her as a protection against the outer world, as a mediator, as it were. She feels as if she were confined within the ring. It is like a magic circle that has been drawn around her. Outside lies the world of anxiety and fear within the positive life. This circle coincides with the reality peculiar to her that surrounds her. 
she dissociates her consciousness from the outer world. Thereafter, she speaks about the small orbits at the center, enumerating these from the outer rim inwards. Quote, I felt well in the first ring at the center. I feel as if seven stars stood above it. From there, I talked to the world in which I had once been, unquote. She does not say in which I am. She does not say, quote, in which I, in which I am, unquote. Evidently, she considers this to be the world in which she has been rather than the one where she is now. Although she lives in this world, to her it appears as some ghost-like world, a kind of recollection uh, or illusion, where, whereas her inner world represents reality, leaving aside interpretation for the moment. Let us simply listen to her words. To her, there appears to exist a world outside in which she once lived, that is, a prenatal world, a paradisal a paradisical world, a celestial world, from which she was born and was thereafter impelled to leave, much like an expulsion from paradise. So here, too, the story of the fall of man, or the fall of the angels, is repeated. Quote, In the second ring, I was cold and shivering. It must be a cold world. I never talked there. I just kind of swam hither and thither over it and a few times I looked into it. I do no longer know what I saw there. I am afraid whenever I think of it. It is terribly cold and, ba and bad there. This ring has the light of the moon." Unquote. The second orbit is treated like a vague recollection. She merely swam hither and thither over it. Similar ideas occur in ancient mythology and in the teachings of the ancients about the becoming of the soul. We, we will discuss these in greater detail later, just as the souls of the dead ascend from the earth to the moon into the receptaculum animorum, so their descend, uh, so their descend again through the moon ring at birth. When the seeress stands in the outermost orbit, she effectively stands in the land of the dead and looks beyond the severing cold ring of the moon into the sun, that is, the innermost sphere. Quote, the third ring is as bright as the sun, but its center is even brighter. I saw an impenetrable depth in it, and the deeper it was, the brighter it became. I never went there. I was only allowed to look into it. I would like to call it the Son of Grace. There in the utmost clarity of the innermost ring, I saw my guide, and from there I also received the prescription, although no longer know, although I no longer know how." Unquote. Here the concept of a female conductress or guide appears for the first time with somnambulistic persons and psychics we always encounter such guiding figures. They act as guardian angels or protecting spirits, attending to the well-being and woes of others. In the case of female som somnambulists, they are very often male figures and vice versa. There are very famous cases such as Mrs. Piper, who, ha who had not just one such figure, but a whole group of controls a veritable small-sized general staff, general staff, a veritable small-sized general staff, which was in constant attendance. Evidently, unquote, evidently, the midpoint is the ultimate depth, that is, the radiant fullness of light. Within its radius stands the guiding principle, which in the case of the cirrus, finds expression in the spirit of her grandmother. Psychologically speaking, within our interior, there stands a guide. We all carry unconscious guidance within us. Even if we think we have been in control, we experience time and again that sometimes it is not we who decide, but rather something inside us that decides the outcome. 
all peoples of the earth believe that there exists another being that directs us and determines our conscious decisions. This being is also the guide of the seeress. Guidance proceeds from the center point. This point, however, is not situated within the center of consciousness, but within the solar plexus. It has been called thus since antiquity, following the discovery that in a state of ecstasy, we are able to see this light through sympathy, that is, through the sympathetic nervous system. There are peoples, and in Greece there are even there, and in Greece there was even a sect who practice ophthalmoscopy, ophthalmoscopy, that is, the contemplation of the navel in order to experience this inner vision. Okay, it goes on, but I'm going to leave it at that for the moment and uh, come back and see you. Um, anybody still with me? <laughs> so uh, that was sort of the weird uh, vision. It's not a weird vision. It's a vision that um, has gone back in mandalas to Paleolithic times, but it so happened that um, Miss Half, uh, Frederica Half, is the series's name, um, was able to describe it in great detail, um, and um, I just note that um, in the sun sphere. Uh, it's like a wall through which nothing could reach her. And, um, and then there's also this issue of um, the revival of an archaic image. New stars in the sky uh, come up in when the Caesars died. If when the Caesars died, the... Um, seers had to go and find another star in the sky which represented uh, the new star and the notion of souls wandering in the sky and um, and you know i note that at my local gym where i go and in in the gym uh, they occasionally put up memes and one of those memes is uh, talking about, you know, when somebody dies, you know, it bec they become a star in the sky. So we're still talking about it in the 21st century, such as it is. Um, now I wanted to talk about why um, one of the other things that Dr. Young is talking about here is... Um, why cardinal numbers one through nine are sacred. And um, I agree with you, Thomas, that the design is somewhat strange, but I'm going to go on. I may put this back up and I will uh, put this design in the Dropbox for those of you who may have interest in studying it. Um, but anyway, uh, there's, there's a little piece about uh, conception of numbers. So, um, so he says, or when a Roman Caesar died, the astronomers had to find a new star in the sky to account for his soul. We also find this idea in the Indians and in poetic language. The fact that there are seven stars corresponds to a mythological conception. Seven is a sacred number, just as all cardinal numbers from one to nine are sacred in different ways in different peoples. The reason for this is that primitives can solely count to ten, since they can count only their two times five fingers. For instance, Swahili has only five numerals. Numbers greater than five are designated by many, 
whether this it be six, a thousand, or a hundred thousand. Before the outbreak of the First World War, rumor had it in East Africa that 1,000 German soldiers had marched through the region. Troops were committed to investigate the incident, and it turned out that there was only a patrol of six men had been seen. Failing, <laughs> uh, failing a corresponding word for the actual number, the corporal who made the sighting had simply reported many. Anyway, and then there's a footnote here about um, ancient beliefs about souls. In general, according to the ancient belief, the moon is the gathering place of departed souls. The abode of departed souls. The claim that the moon was so fertilized by the many souls of soldiers killed during the First World War that a green spot appeared on it goes back to the Greek Armenian mystic, writer, composer, and choreographer George Ivanovich Gurdjieff. According to Gurdjieff, I don't know how to pronounce him, Gurdjieff, according to Gurdjieff, the moon feeds on souls, and when the moon is very hungry, there are wars. Jung quoted this story also in his seminar on children's dreams. In, Bar in Barbara Hanna's English edition of these lectures, however, and in contrast to all other lecture notes, this belief of Gurdjieff's is rendered differently. He would have been convinced that the spots on the sun are caused by the unusual number of souls that migrated there during the war, and I, Jung, have met two doctors who firmly believe him. Okay. All right. So, I'll go to That. All right, then there's Dr. Young's summary. Let me go back to that now. This is from page 69. Allow me, to Allow me to conclude today's lecture with some final remarks on this case. An intensive withdrawal from outer reality stimulates the background and the inner world, giving rise to three groups of phenomena. One, extrasensory perceptions, such as clairvoyance, the perception of qualities through crystals, or perception through the epigastric region. Two, the apparition of ghosts. Three, the peculiar vision of the sun sphere, or mandala. Mandala is the Indian term for circle. All so-called supernatural perceptions are mainly clairvoyant phenomena. Clairvoyance expresses itself through the senses and the spirit, and they in turn express themselves in terms of space and time. We are at first inclined to regard the existence of such matters which simply defy the laws of nature as pure nonsense, but too much irrefutable factual experience has been obtained about them for them to be ignored. This should not amount to positing a metaphysical claim. I read that sentence again. This should not amount to positing a metaphysical claim. We should merely exercise patience with such phenomena until we gradually discern what exactly is involved. And as I've described on many occasions, uh, the tarot cards where uh, the tarot cards can seem like clairvoyance, but in fact, it's very easy to understand how they work. Hardly a week passes in my practice in which a patient does not enter with such a dream or experience. Evidently, this field is filled with the most incredible possibilities of deception. 
behind lurks a dark superstition, and yet our entire scientific world has emerged from precisely such a dark superstition from a world of magic. Now, there's sort of a humorous uh, piece here. Just a second. So, Dr. Jung had a number of complaints um, about his lectures, <laughs> and uh, they came mainly from young people. <clears throat> and so, um, I'll read a couple of footnotes and uh, things that he said. This is in Lecture 9 now, and I'm reading from page 71. Um, submitted questions. The first correspondent, a lady blessed with steady good fortune, is indignant that my lectures are so popular. Footnote, i.e. intelligible to the general public in layman's terms. This refers to the following letter, Zurich, 10 December 1933. Dear Doctor, at our short encounter after your lecture about a fortnight ago, you asked if your explanations would be popular enough. In the meantime, I have now heard from a number of people, students and people who have their feet on the ground, how they find your lectures. Surely you will be interested in learning that a small part of your large audience thinks all of them find that the lectures are too popular. Not all of these people are specific not all of these people are specifically knowledgeable in psychology. Surely, surely you will be relieved to know, since you are used to talking before a highly educated audience, that your very interested and attentive listeners can still follow you even if the basic concepts are explained at somewhat less length. <laughs> in other words, cut down the length in hoping that I could render you, dear doctor, a small service with these lines, I remain yours, Doris Schlumpf. I kid you not, Doris Schlumpf, S-C-H-L-U-M-P-F. And that's from the ETH archives. So there, now going on with Dr. Jung's comment, uh, there are quite a number of reactions from younger members of the audience that have confirmed my worst fears. I would have spoken over the top of their heads, and they could not imagine for which reasons I have discussed at length such a curious case as that of the Cirrus, which evidently dates from the last century. Footnote. This could refer to some reactions of students gathered and summarized by a participant named Otto, they concur that the lectures did not meet their expectations, specifically that the topics were too far-fetched and historical, and that Jung would not talk about contemporary problems and his own psychological theory. Jung also mentioned similar complaints at the beginning of the 13th lecture, pages 106 and 107. So, reading on now. I chose this case with a secret intention in mind. In so doing, I have espoused standard clinical methodology by selecting a classic example of an illness offering a general description, and thereafter discussing the entire symptomology and pathology of the illness based on the example. The case of the cirrus is an indisputable classic empirical example, and therefore allows us to consider certain basic facts. I've gone to some lengths to set out the details of the case to help you attain a clearer sense of the various phenomena involved. Should the case strike you as unfamiliar or strange, then you would do then you would do so on account of your lack of knowledge. You are, simply, you are simply unaware that your own case exhibits all of these basic facts too, only they lie concealed in the dark background of your psyche. You have no knowledge of them, that is all. 
we must become better acquainted with some of the general features of the human psyche. This human psyche is nothing well known. Indeed, it constitutes a great unknown. The ideas that I have set forth in my lectures on the basis of this case have already been published, and I am not to blame if those are not more widely known. For the moment, <laughs> not to blame, right? Put the blame on somebody else. For the moment, I shall not further discuss this. Bear with me as I proceed with my discussion of this case to a satisfactory conclusion in order to alleviate for you some of the burden of misapprehension. Uh, this is the hair doctor's way of whipping up on his audience. <laughs> Thomas says, maybe it was the Cirrus's radical removal from the world around her that created visions. For us, it might be going on a drastic media diet where we stop paying attention to the outer world. Sensory deprivation generally produces hallucinations given enough time, but with special people, they might have meanings useful to others. Uh, I certainly agree with all of that. I think uh, visions, are, and certainly dreams, but visions also often come from emotional um, sources. And I've obviously experienced many of them, so, and I've described them here, so I'm not going to go into it further today. But then, then Dr. Jung goes on with his lecture, and I want to read this portion. In the previous lecture, I highlighted the three characteristic phenomena. One, extrasensory perceptions. Two, ghosts and specters. Three, the peculiar sun sphere. With regard to these extrasensory perceptions, let us just assume that some of these curious facts about clairvoyance really apply. We must not let ourselves be deterred by superstition and fraudulent trickery. We can no longer ascertain the facts in the previous. One can even experiment with these matters, even in company, as I have done on countless occasions. They always happen whenever a person like the Cirrus directs their entire attention inward instead of outward. Then such dreams, premonitions, and perceptions occur that border on extrasensory perception. This is simply a fact, a quite uncomfortable fact, it is true, but nevertheless we must put up with it. It is my pleasure to admit as much, unlike others who, for the sake of a theory, simply deny a whole bothersome part of a science. Um, and what I would add here is that he's also referring to his own experiences before the beginning of World War I. Uh, so then he says, unlike others, for the sake of a theory, simply deny a whole bothersome part of a science and leave its treatment to the poets, I for one cannot allow myself that. If you so wish, I can give you my word of honor that such matters exist, and we can thus incorporate them in our conception. I am relating the case of the Cirrus for precisely this reason. We thus face a most unpleasant and uncanny manner, matter. <clears throat> We thus face a most unpleasant and uncanny matter. As a consequence, we must also defy the concepts of space and time. Of course, this relativization of time and space is unbearable for some mediocre brains and is therefore simply denied. Such matters, however, do occur wicked though this seems, and it is up to us to engage with them. Already before our time, many of the brightest minds have found that regarding time and space, things are not quite as they seem, that is at least admissible to doubt the absoluteness of these dimensions. Now, it so happens by synchronicity <clears throat> that today I received 
um, the Rochester Review, which is the uh, monthly review from the University of Rochester. <clears throat> and on the cover here, you see Rochester's newest Nobel laureate. Her name is Donna Strickland, <clears throat> PhD, um, and she wrote a dissertation on how to use light more effectively. Three, days, three decades later, she has the Nobel Prize, and she became uh, the third woman after Madame Curie to win the Nobel Prize with her professor, um, and his name I will get for you in a moment, <clears throat> Gerard Moreau. Okay, but it's this year's Nobel Prize for uh, Physics, and uh, because we're talking about time and space um, relativity, let me read just a short portion of this Nobel uh, discussion here. As laser science grew as a discipline in the 1980s, researchers were incrementally increasing the intensity of laser pulses, resulting in damage to the amplifying material. Moreau had come up with an idea to clear the hurdle by perfecting the technique known as chirped pulse amplification. The technique involved a three-part sequence, stretching a laser pulse thousands of times so that the power was low, amplifying the pulse to higher intensities, and then compressing the pulse in time back to its exact original duration. Moreau knew the pulse needed to be perfectly compressed, yet still retain its amplification in order to make the technique work more effectively. If you can do it exactly, then you can do a much higher power, Moreau says. He had the idea of put, to put amplification in the middle of the process, a novel concept at the time, according to Strickland. Different people were trying to get short pulses amplified in different ways, but it was thinking outside the box to stretch first and then amplify, she says. Chirped pulse amplification, however, was only a theory. Strickland and Moreau still had to make it work. At the Laboratory for Laser Energetics at Rochester, Strickland tested different laser systems to create laser pulses that were short and high-powered, but that wouldn't destroy the amplifying material. In 1985, she succeeded demonstrating the stunning advance in laser power that the tabletop terawatt laser, or T-cubed laser. At the time, Strickland didn't recognize that research would interest an audience outside the laser physics community. It was, I was aware that it was going to be big for scientists working in high intensity laser physics, she says, but I didn't know it would have relevance for the general public so quickly. And so, just uh, to give you a sense of where these things are used, um, they're used in laser eye surgery, such as LASIK. Uh, they're used in precise machining of materials, such as the cover glass used in smartphones. And um, Well, then there's, there's many others, but anyway, the point is that she was able to um, compress the pulse in time back to its exact original duration. And so it's a question of changing the wavelengths and so on. But uh, I just thought that was an interesting synchronicity that came up. Whether any of you do or not, I don't know. Uh, and uh, Sean says, once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess. Uh, 
I imagine the correlation rockets as ideas to Carl Jung's lectures. Um, sure, I mean, he was, um, Dr. Jung was way ahead of his time. And in, in these lectures, which are more informal lectures and therefore easy for we laymen to get our arms around, uh, I think they're going to be very useful. This is only volume one, and I suppose it's going to take several years to publish all eight volumes that are planned. Um, but um, anyway, he, he goes on to say, if time and space are relative dimensions, they cannot have absolute validity. Consequently, we must assume that an absolute reality has different properties from our spatial temporal reality. In other words, there exists a space that is unlike our space, a time that is unlike our time. That is, it is possible for phenomena to occur that are not subject to the conditions of time and space. Please bear in mind that psychic matters are neither thick nor thin, neither big nor small, neither round nor squared, neither heavy nor light, and so on, but exquisitely non-spatial. And secondly, that it is forbiddingly difficult to determine a time of the psyche. You will find it almost impossible to establish any time in which a psychic process occurs. You can measure response times, but what prevails is an enormously complex magnitude that consists of a whole array of quite unknown figures. In contrast, we have all had the strangest experience that under certain circumstances, psychic processes require incredibly little time, for instance, in so-called arousal dreams. And then he gives an example of an arousal dream. Now, now, <laughs> it's not that kind of arousal. It's uh, arousal as wake up, the wake up dream. Anyway, here's the footnote. In October 1938, Jung used this in the following examples, also in his keynote lecture on the method of dream interpretation during his seminar on children's dreams. There he revealed that his first example is in fact a dream he had had himself and gave more details. As a university student, I had to get up at half past five in the morning because the botany lecture started at seven o'clock. This was very tough for me. I always had to be awakened. The maid had to pound at the door until I finally woke up. So once I had a very detailed dream I was reading the newspaper. It said that a certain tension between Switzerland and foreign countries had arisen. Then many people came and discussed the political situation. Then there came another newspaper, and again it contained new telegrams and new articles. Many people got excited. Again, there were discussions and scenes in the streets, and eventually mobilization. Soldiers, artillery, cannons were fired. Now the war had broken out, but it was knocking on the door. I had the clear impression that the dream had lasted for a very long time and come to a climax with the knocking. Um, but I think his point here is that um, he in fact had the whole dream in a, in a few seconds. Uh, Thomas says his lectures go up out in one time and land at another time. Rockets moving forward in time, not just space. Uh, yep, definitely. Um, let's see, what else have I got here? Okay, so he makes this point that the actual soul, the objective psyche, borders on non-spatiality and atemporality. And um, the, the Romans used the term imago. 
and um, and then on page seventy six there was some interesting things. Our Aurora says time and space are relativistic concepts, like almost all things we experience through our sensory experiences. Since it's all relativistic, can we understand absolute reality through these means, as Sean says, Einstein? I'm not sure. <clears throat> now, what was this? Oh, there, there was a point that was made that um, the Cirrus had to have all the souls of her ancestors within her in order to feel well. And, uh, and what Jung says about this is, you would say, it suddenly occurred to me, but Mrs. Hoff would be addressed by ghosts. So in other words, um, an idea comes to your mind and, you know, you say it suddenly occurred to me. But for her, instead of an idea coming to her mind, a ghost would come to her mind, all her ancestor. And then he says um, that um, consciousness, our consciousness is roused only by sufficient energy, such as light and sound. And then he also says, and being in love, which is being possessed by or hit by a god. And um, I remember um, that... I went to my 30th high school reunion, and uh, I had not seen any of these people in 30 years because I had gone to high school in Japan, and it was a U.S. military school, and we had all gone to the winds after we graduated. And so we never saw each other for 30 years, and finally one of my classmates uh, got ambitious and this was before you could look everybody else everybody up on google and he got a copy of the white pages on a on a hard drive and the national white pages of the united states and he tracked everybody down and so we had a reunion uh it was yokohama high school but we had this reunion in glenwood springs colorado and At the end of the evening, I went to bed and I suddenly burst into tears and my mind kind of, I wept and realigned at that time because I realized that I had been in love with all of the girls. <laughs> I had seen all these girls uh, for the first time in 30 years and I had been in love with all of them at one time or another. Uh, Sean says, you may think you've just had an original thought, but it's more likely you just haven't done enough research. Sure. Uh, actually, I heard this comment from a friend, but by his own logic, I figured it wasn't original to him, so I've decided not to give him credit. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I like a lot of things have been thought all the way back to Egyptian times. <laughs> um, and so Dr. Jung makes the observation that um, you may think you're possessed by something, but by the souls of your ancestors. And he, and he says, why not? Because... Um, you know, you would normally say that you have your grandmother's nose or your grandfather's eyes or whatever it is. And so why isn't it possible for you also to have certain aspects of his soul 
passed along his psyche. Um, and then he goes on um, to talk about a very normal people uh, being compensated madmen. And uh, he always made the comment, bring me a normal person and I will fix him for you. And what he meant by that is that whenever somebody came in who was normal, uh, that was slightly suspicious to him. He felt that madness must lie beneath, and I certainly know that to be true. Um, and um, <clears throat> then on the uh, circle uh, issue, um, apparently uh, there's a peculiar circle in Dr. Faust's Coercion of Hell, and the recipes for invocation of ghosts and we uh, and dr young says that we've lost all knowledge pertaining to these matters and circle three circles to ward off evil spirits and then he goes on and talks about the importance of circles and how the oldest depictions of circles date back to paleolithical period um, Paleolithic period, which was before the invention of the wheel. And, um, and uh, there's also ritualistic practices of circling, i.e. around a stupa, uh, clockwise, you go clockwise, or around a temenos, which is a, um, a sacred place or garden or something like that. And then I was going to read to you about the founding of a Roman city. Um, so, um, Jung alluded briefly, this is in a footnote, Jung alluded briefly to this tradition in his commentary of The Secret of the Golden Flower, but gave most detailed description in his seminar on dream interpretation, ancient and modern. Quote, Jung, what, do, what was done when the ancient Roman city was founded? Participant, one walked around the Temenos, a protective piece of land set apart as a sacred domain, a sacred precinct or temple enclosure, set off and dedicated to a god. Jung, how was that done? Participant, by circumambulations. Jung, yes, and with what? Participant, with a plow. Jung, yes, it was used to plow the sulcus primogenius, a magical furrow around the center of the temple, Temnus. This was a mandala, and what was done in the middle of this plowed up area participant. Fruits and sacrifices were buried. Young, at first a hole, the fundus was made, and then sacrifices to the thonic gods were put into it. In other words, the center was accentuated. Young seems to allude to the older Roman method of surveying field boundaries and building sites described by Pliny in the natural history. Um, so anyway, that's more about mandalas. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's see. Sean says, I look exactly like my grandfather. And so you might have some, uh, some of your grandfather in you. I know that I certainly have some of the hard-headed Dutchman in me and, um, I, my granddaughter does too, because my granddaughter, who's only one year old now, she's number eight of nine, two of them were born together, eight of nine and nine of nine <laughs> were born together. But anyway, the granddaughter of the twins um, raised her head one day and uh, she gave her father a concussion and put him out of work for two weeks. <laughs> And so um, that's giving new meaning to the heart, the 
a hard-headed Dutchman, except that's a hard-headed Dutch woman. Um, and so Sean says, I believe in an immortal soul. Science has proved that nothing disintegrates into nothingness. Life and soul therefore cannot disintegrate into nothingness. And so are immortal. Um, anyway, um, I was reading a lot of other fascinating stuff from um, in Belford Ulanoff today, which I think I'm going to talk about next week. Um, okay, but let me let me just summarize to finish off with a series of perverse, keeping in mind that I have done in uh, about three hours what Dr. Young did in five hours of contigu contiguous lecturing and I haven't given so I haven't given you all the good stuff uh, but that's because you need to go buy this book History of Modern Psychology by C.G. Young and one of the comments about this book was that Dr. Freud had written a book called The History of Modern Psychology or something to that effect about 30 years earlier. And so this series of lectures, which were called this, The History of Modern Psychology, was Dr. Jung's counterpoint to that. And so uh, just to reiterate then, when introversion intensifies, which is what happened to the cirrus, the three phenomena I mentioned become apparent. One, space and time become relative. Presentments and dreams come true and telepathic experience occurs. Two, we find certain autonomous psychic contents, ultimately leading to personifications and an apparition of ghosts. And three, symbols of a psychic center are experienced. This center does not coincide with consciousness and is generally perceived as a source of life, equivalent to an experience of God. One can recognize therein the essence of religion. And um, so I might, let's see, we have some time um, okay, let me read you one more page here. The cirrus is most certainly a border case. While it is very rare to encounter such cases, Quite a number of them have been recorded throughout history. In contrast, cases involving compensation are more frequent. These cases will not strike us as strange as the one we discussed, and we will see more clearly how familiar we are with such experiences. If people are not destined to die in a state of complete introversion, a reaction will have to set in. A reaction will have set in and a certain extroversion will become apparent. The background of the soul is clouded over and energetic charge of the contents decreases, plasticity wanes, and the images become paled and blurred. We find all indications of an outer reality that interferes with the background. The image of the background of the soul becomes translated into the banality of everyday life and the spotlight of experience is directed elsewhere. We will consider the main stages of this process, not in regard to any particular case, but as I have been able to observe it generally. In the first phase, the center point vanishes, just as the sun sphere did in the case of the spheres. This vision of the sun grows dim. While it might remain intuitive, it ceases to play a role. In many cases, it becomes unconscious, which what remains is the intermediate realm of so-called ghosts and those phenomena that manifest some uncertainty regarding time and space 
that is experiences of a telepathic nature. And I would just refer you back to uh, Skip's dream in the sheriff's office uh, in which I had a dream about a rising dark sun, which was a sun in eclipse. And, um, and so that was manifesting, but then I moved on in that dream. But anyway, there's a video about that, so I'll just refer you to it. In the second phase, the autonomous figures, namely the personifications and ghosts, disappear. Presentments and telepathic dreams continue to exist, as well as curious manifestations in consciousness that elude rational explanation. What is known appears strange, forgetfulness occurs, partial amnesia, and so forth. Only vestiges remain in the autonomous contents, which had previously become personified. Such phenomena can still be observed in primitives who ascribe them to the presence of ghosts. It is always a ghost, a witch, or a sorcerer who takes something away from them. With the, men with the mentally ill, this condition is known as thought withdrawal. And I would just mention um, my discussion of various autonomous fig figures that have appeared in my life, including my vision of Mephistopheles, among others, uh, which you can find video about also here. Um, and um, and I, I would also say that this idea of things becoming dim, it's something like um, a dream. A dream is very vivid and comes through with energy, but when you wake up, it gets blotted out by the banality of everyday life, as Dr. Jung says. Okay, then going on. The third phase occurs when the entire psychic background goes dark, that is, when nothing remains of these autonomous inner psychic phenomena. The person's memory seems to be normal, and the psychic auto autonomous inner phenomena no longer seem to exist. Here we approach normality. The more manifest so-called normality becomes, the more a strange phenomenon occurs, namely a defensive attitude toward the matters of the background that no longer appear attractive. One is no longer tempted to have dreams or to experience the appearance of ghosts. The entire affair becomes uncanny, repugnant, repulsive, childish, ridiculous. Such people begin to build a thick wall of rationalistic skepticism and scientific attitudes and seal the entire matter airtight. If anything creeps through nonetheless, it is dismissed as merely psychological. This, however, prompts a true and proper witch's Sabbath of incompatible complexes. Consciousness grows too strong in proportion to the degree in which the background is walled off. Those people find themselves terribly interesting and important and become most dreadful bores. It is nothing but an exaggeration, a showing off, but in the manner that has lost the characteristic experience. It is a pumped up story, something that is intended to impress. If such a condition persists, we speak of neurosis, an inflation of the subject occurs and everything becomes psychologized. Since those people are wrong and actually know that they are, however, they become oversensitive. Hypersensitivity is always suspicious, and one has to walk on eggshells around them in order not to tread on their psychological toes. And so uh, I guess one could say that might sound like me, except that I've um, kept, I, I think that I've kept the, the pathways open for continuing to see these things, but it isn't for the purpose of pumping up. At least I hope my listeners don't think I'm trying to pump myself up. I'm only trying to pass along in the, in the uh, spirit of a uh, relay race. I'm trying to pass the baton on to all of you so that we can keep these ideas going around the world. Um, 
Sean says, reminds me of when my mom was a child. She flushed many hundred dollar bills down the toilet. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> our Aurora says, so I've been thinking about this as personalities are grounded in our identities, which are dependent on external reactions to our being. Whereas if we are not grounded in our external identities, but an internal space, we feel more like a stranger to the outer world. When we vibrate with the external, the external appears stable. When we vibrate with the internal, the external identity appears more fluid and internal phenomena appear more tangible. Perhaps these ESP phenomena are a result of being more in tune with the internal phenomena. At least that's what I'm inclined to believe. As noted earlier, there are no original thoughts. Well, um, what I would say about ESP is that you're not going to, um, to necessarily stop them. It's a question of whether you hear them or recognize them. Um, as I said a couple of weeks ago, I attended a weekend workshop on ESP once with my wife. And what was demonstrated to us there is that ESP is just completely normal and very common and it's everywhere. And, and, um, and that's what I took out of that weekend. And so, you know, it's a question of becoming sensitized to these things and recognizing them when they occur. I'm not sure they have any value to you. I mean, if you go to uh, lunch with your friends during your work day and start talking about your ESP experiences, it may not be um, that good of an idea. <laughs> it could be <laughs> that they'll start thinking of you as a wacko. But my purpose here is to point out to you that very likely you're not a wacko, that these are re routine things and they come up often. And if you have these experiences or you have um, experiences with the psyche, any of the experiences that we've talked about here over the last three years, um, you may have a special blessing in that you may uh, be able to get on in life um, better than others can. And uh, Dr. Ulanoff talks about, um, about opening space in your psyche. I mean, when we're born and young growing up, we think we're a very specific thing and we're not supposed to talk to strangers or go do this or that, whatever it is. Uh, and as we get older, we our idea of the world expands and we find place uh, within that expanded world. Um, there's a, a common Buddhist story about the frog that's born in a well and he thinks the world is like the well. And he hops out of the well one day and meets another frog that comes from the ocean. And um, they go for, they decide to travel together. The way I heard it was they travel together and they get to a mud puddle. And then the young frog says, is, is this like the ocean? And the older frog says, no, much bigger. And then they go a little farther and they end up at a river. And they, he says, wow, this is huge. Is this like the ocean? The older frog says, no. And they go on and they come to a large lake. And same deal. And finally, they come to the ocean. And the ocean of possibility, what this represents, of course, is the, um, although I don't think the Buddhist consciously intended this, but what it represents is the ocean of the unconscious and the 
and the um, vastness of each one of our psyches and and so in the in the story the young fra frog's brain just explodes but i think in our lifetimes our perspective about the world and how large it is and how being in the world is in fact um just expands and expands i know that clearly happened to me because um i spent eight years in japan and i spent a couple of years in india and about six months in saudi arabia and and i visited many other countries something like 80 countries in my lifetime but uh in um in those specific cases those are places that um you know i also spent a lot of time in pakistan and bangladesh as well and um you know if you haven't experienced those places your idea of them would be very very limited uh, but as you start to experience them you go wow <laughs> this is like the uh, like the ocean uh, and let's say thomas says i remember the frog story it's a good one uh Ch chuang tzu Taoist tale. Yes, it, it may be. I, it came across my desk a day or two ago <laughs> from my uh, one of my Rigpa groups, but um, it. Uh, but anyway, I keep hearing it, and so the idea is that if we learn about these things and we consider these issues, then things get bigger and bigger and um, and our view of the world gets bigger and bigger and then we can go out and do different things um, so that's about all I've prepared for tonight I've been doing quite a lot of reading in Ann Ulanoff's work the last couple of weeks and um, and I want to talk about some of the things in her book. Um, I just got this book today, uh, The Living God, Our Living Psyche. So I haven't looked at that yet, but the, um, in this book, The Wisdom of the Psyche, which I got used, and probably all these books you could get used on uh, Amazon, so it wouldn't cost you very much to obtain them. Uh, but they are very powerful, and uh, they talk about um, one of the things that really got my attention today was that um, Ulanoff said at one point that uh, Dr. Jung got it wrong in answer to Job, which was quite a surprise because I have never heard of a Jungian analyst saying that Dr. Jung got something wrong. But as I uh, read what she had to say about it, um, I think that she's right. And uh, we can talk about that. But um, she's, uh, she's talking about the devil's trick. Um, and among other things and she thinks that dr young fell for the devil's trick um, particularly um, when he was talking about um, about the evil um, being in god and mind you she's both a theologian and a psychologist and so her point is that if you look at these issues only from the point of psychology, then uh, then Dr. Jung is right. But if you 
look at it from the point of view of psychology and theology, then you get a different perspective, and that's uh, quite an interesting idea. So the book is uh, The Wisdom of the Psyche, and I'd urge you all to take a look at it. Um, Aurora says, uh, reminds me of the old problems. How do you explain to a fish that it's in water? I suppose the only way is to know the existence of the other. Uh, Sean says, at any moment, the frog could have become the trickster archetype and said, this well is way bigger than the ocean. Um, yeah, would you believe that? I mean, we've got enough tricksters around who actually are believable, unfortunately, to a lot of our fellow men. <laughs> um, and Thomas says, perhaps the well frog could just dive down deeper and deeper in his own well. Uh, that might be a possibility also, uh, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> but... Anyway, let me see if I can find this section about Dr. Jung. Because um, in the last two weeks, somehow, and I don't know how this happened, I managed to buy two Amazon books twice. And I don't know why. Uh, some something I'm doing wrong on Amazon, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah. I, in, in this copy, which I've not marked up, uh, I don't think I can find it that quickly, um, unfortunately. Uh, but I will address it next week. And Obviously, there's lots of things to think about between now and then. Um, Sean says, um, too many anthropomorphic tales about the fox being cunning turned him into the trickster. I think even in Pinocchio, the fox tricks him. Um, yeah, I guess we were trying not to scare the children, or we were trying to scare the children in fairy tales. Um, and, um, and that's the way we learn, by telling stories. And, oh, by the way, um, I, I ran into this list of good movies the other day, and, um, and one... Uh, it's a list of 25 great movies that you probably have never seen. And one of them is The Man from Earth. And have any of you ever seen this movie, The Man from Earth? And it's about, um, it, it is about a caveman who could not die and who was still alive 14,000 years after he was born. Uh, and it's just a very fascinating uh, conversation that's worth looking at. And the other one um, is called Waking Life. Uh, my wife thought it was about lucid dreaming, and it is sort of about lu lucid dreaming, but it's called Waking Life, I believe, and um, it has a lot of interesting philosophy. Both of them are not um, sort of mainstream films, but they, uh, the, the Man from Earth won a number of uh, Sundance Awards and so on, and uh, Aurora likes waking life. It goes by pretty fast. I mean, uh, it's basically talking about a lot of different philosophies. And um, uh, you probably have to watch it 10 times in order to, um, in order to completely get it. And Sean says, man is the best computer we can put aboard a spacecraft and the only one that can be mass-produced with unskilled 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> we certainly seem to have that one under control. <laughs> but uh, the good news is that we uh, landed in sight on the surface of Mars uh, today. And so uh, a very good friend of mine who is a, I won't say exactly what his role is, but who's a leading scientist in NASA has new work to do thanks to the InSight lander successfully landing on the surface of Mars today. Uh, Mr. Krishnamurti says we are not created for any grander purpose than the ants that are there or the flies that are hovering around us or the mosquitoes that are sucking our blood. Um, well, that's a lovely thought. <laughs> Thomas is, I'd suggest a German film that greatly surprised me with its ending. Look who's back. Hitler re reappears in 2015 Germany. Hmm. Well, you know, whether he physically reappears or not, Certainly, there are issues there that we need to uh, attend to. And uh, uh, so, Mr. Krishnamurti, um, how to address what you say? Um, it, you know, obviously, your statement is. Uh, correct and um, um, Becker, the man who wrote Denial of Death, talked about the fact that we're no more important than a lizard or a potato. And my psychologist friend, uh, Sheldon Solomon from Skidmore College University, uh, said said that <laughs> and uh yes but uh, by the same token uh as far as we know um we're the only consciousness in the universe at least so far that we've observed and or the only consciousness that what knows that we will die and that sort of thing and can th think about it and project outward um, away from the earth, I suppose, is one other way to discuss it. And so, as Dr. Jung says, you know, we represent the consciousness of, of God or the God image, the metaphysical God. And, um, and so, you know, in order to live our lives, we need to have meaning in our lives. And so having the position that you describe of the ants and the mosquitoes is, you know, okay, but that, you know, that sort of invites me to go uh, step on my head or put it under a car wheel. <laughs> let somebody roll over it <laughs> uh, because uh, why bother and you know I don't know why we bother but I think that if we have an attitude about life that gives us some meaning uh, that is a useful thing and I think that Dr. Jung felt that way too um, So, Mr. Krishnamurti says, you can have the courage to climb the mountain, swim the lakes, go on the raft to the other side of the Atlantic or Pacific that any fool can do, but the courage to be on your own, to stand on your two solid feet is something which cannot be given by somebody. Uh, yes, it can, but, but I think that we can, uh, we can't give it, but we can at least point a direction of where it can be found. Um, you know, I, as I've discussed in this group, I've had uh, quite a number of religious experiences. I have them almost daily. Um, I had a synchronicity experience that I discussed in this session. And um, 
and I don't expect you to have the same reaction to those experiences that I did. Those were my experiences. But all I'm trying to do is point out that those are my experiences. Now go out and find your own, um, at least to the folks that are watching us, talking to us. And let's see. Sean says, yeah, I saw the news about the lander on Mars. Um, Thomas said the movie about Hitler in 2015 was just a funny turn. The organi organismal model of the universe is a good way of looking at it, I think. Uh, we could say we're no more important, but also we're infinitely important, just as everything else. Um, and, you know, Dr. Jung made the comment at one point that um, if everything were destroyed, uh, it would all begin again, very simply. It would all begin again and start again. And maybe it is starting in millions of places all over the universe. We can't say right now. But it would really be interesting to know uh, if it is. Um, you know, I have a friend who's a exobiologist. That's a biologist about space. Um, and we asked her what she thought would be a high point for her career. And she said she thought it would be a high point to uh, find a microbe any place other than Earth. And so <laughs> that's a start, I guess. Um, and Aurora says, as we zoom out far enough, everything appears as just random matter and space. But if we zoom in enough, one can find meaning in the smallest of relationships. That's a good point. I think that that's worth holding on to that point. Um, you know, we may, you may luck out in your lifetime and find contact with little green men. I don't know, but I think it's important for us to uh, get in contact with one another first. Um, Thomas is... Uh, Thomas says, it's not that we have a grand purpose, but that we take some responsibility for our fellow ants and mosquitoes. Um, and thanks for your observation about my insights and constructive criticisms, <laughs> Mr. Krishnamurti. Uh, and um, Thomas says, not sure the ants and the mosquitoes care so much about their fellow insects or are capable of caring as we are, even though we act like biters or, or bloodsuckers. Yes, it's true. Uh, and, you know, I heard, um, uh, I think it was uh, David White, who is a famous Irish poet, a contemporary Irish poet, talking about on an audio tape one time um, persuading uh, a green pea to get into his pot and not flop across the floor because then it's going to become a human being. And, you know, I, I sometimes instinctively react to things that I'm eating, whether it's... Uh, um, and something that ever had a face, which is what my vegan friend uh, doesn't want to eat anything that ever had a face. But even, you know, I find even a kernel of rice or a kernel of orso as uh, something that I don't want to put down the garbage disposal. And so I urge that extra piece to jump on my plate and become a human being rather than become 
just part of the slurry that's going out in, into our lakes and rivers. <laughs> of course, it will have a new life, but uh, I'd like to catch all of them. In, in Buddhism, it's said that getting a human life as opposed to any other kind of life is like having a life preserver floating in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and you have to dive into the Pacific Ocean and come in in the middle come up in the middle of that life preserver and if you do then you get a human life otherwise you get something else and it probably takes a long time to get through that life preserver so make sure that you make the most of your human life um, and, Thomas says, we can bite one another or love one another. I wonder if the mosquito has that choice. Maybe not. I mean, because a lot of things are instinctual. And one of the key things that Dr. Jung is talking about is instinct. And those instincts come up on the arrow side of the, of the page, not on the logo side. And this is why the alchemists and Paracelsus started to get into problems because um, you know the the Christian church wanted to do everything by the word uh, in the beginning was the word and here are the rules and this is how you do it and unfortunately our instinct doesn't work that way I mean it can to a certain extent but ultimately there is revolution um, So, so maybe we can call them bites of love from mos of mosquito bites. I think they're bites of instinct, and uh, I, I don't, uh, I don't hold back from hitting a mosquito and then saying on to on to your next life. <laughs> he didn't want to be a mosquito anyway. Uh, <laughs> Art Peterson says, the shack helped me understand God better. Uh, wh who are you asking that question to? And, um, you know, if, if you're asking me to help you understand God, I think that we're in trouble. Uh, Krishnamurti says, I'm too nihilistic to enjoy life and too scared of death to kill myself. The irony is that I feel like a lot of people feel this way. Uh, right now, I think that that's true. It, you know, it may be that that feeling comes and goes. Um, you know, what I would say is that, um, you know, you only get one life. And so, um, you know, you may believe in reincarnation, but you know, if you reincarnate as a as a slug or a or a tick, <laughs> maybe that's not quite so much fun as being a human being. I don't know, uh, or maybe you don't care. I suppose, um, but I wanted to go back to this: understand God better. If you if you go to um, the playlist on the home page of this channel called uh, Blunt Psychiatrist versus Theologians, uh, you'll find a number of letters that Dr. Jung wrote uh, to theologians trying to explain his position about God and about religion as such and Christianity as such. And you know, I feel that he, uh, unlike Nietzsche, who was a nihilist and who, um, you know, basically uh, wrote off God, God is dead, um, Dr. Jung came along and found God, found where he lives and how he goes about doing the works of God. And, um, and so I, I have... Uh, taped 
to the front of my computer, so I will read it to you. Um, this is Dr. Jung's definition of God. God is the name by which I designate all things which cross my willful path violently and recklessly, all things which upset my subjective views, plans, and intentions, and change the course of my life for better or for worse. And I certainly, um, when the course of my life has been changed for better or for worse, I certainly have felt the the uh, rough hand of God in that, <laughs> and, um, and so it's not a question of believing, it's a question of knowing, and what, if I understand it correctly, and I'm not a Jungian analyst, and I'm not a mental health professional, but as I understand from Dr. Edinger, the objective of Jungian analysis, and also apparently the objective in Alcoholics Anonymous and all the 12-step programs, is for you to have an experience of God. And if you've had that experience, then, um, then you're going to no, then you don't need to believe, then you know. And uh, let's see if I can give you, I sh I've got photographs or videos of some of my experiences, I think. Let me just see if I have them on this. If I don't, I can get them quickly. Um, but I'm talking about a... Um, about something that happens probably by synchronicity that you know couldn't happen except that it did. Um, and so let me get this picture for you. Okay, that name is already in use, so why can't I find it? Okay. Um, I'll name it something else because I can't find it. Okay, so I'm blessed to have the U.S. Naval Academy two miles from where I live. And um, at the Academy, there is a chapel, which is... Um, the um, is the cathedral of the navy so called and so this is so on a few occasions in the last five years i've gone into the chapel for solace uh, because something was going on in my life that was really upsetting me and i wanted to um, I wanted to have a few words with the Almighty about it. And um, on one of these occasions, I was really down in the dumps. I, I was so sad and upset. And uh, I was alone in the chapel. It was very dark. And um, in this picture, which you're seeing here, uh, this is a chapel on the left side of the cross in the, in the chapel, which is in the shape of a, of a cathedral. And so it's the left arm of the cross. And you can see in that image uh, a Tiffany stained glass window. And you can see how it's so much better than three stained glass windows immediately below it. Uh, which are not of the same quality at all. But I have a habit of going to a specific pew uh, in the chapel, and it was dark that morning. Nobody else was there. And it's a chapel that seats 2,000 people. And so I was just having a quiet moment. And suddenly, um, this light 
came upon me and I felt its heat and I looked up and this is what I saw and it was so remarkable that I said wait a minute nobody's going to believe this I have to take a photograph of this which I did and then I turned around and I took this selfie and so you can see that how dark it is in the chapel and yet this light was only on me and you can see how my demeanor had just suddenly changed and my whole attitude about my life and what was going on at that time suddenly changed just because for that one or two minutes um, the light of the of the sun came across my face and so in this photograph you're seeing uh, behind me uh, it looks like it's a gargoyle with an open mouth but actually it's the it's the great seal of the US Naval Academy <laughs> for what it's worth um, but anyway um, so um, that for me was a religious experience and it totally changed my attitude that day and it happens that I caught it on my cell phone and uh, you can find a few more um, you can find some actual videos um, in the playlist called uh, breakthrough breakthroughs to the unconscious um, but if you have those kind of experiences, uh, then uh, you don't need to believe anymore. Then you know, and that's the point of what Dr. Jung was saying. And um, so anyway, um, Thomas says, yet Nietzsche the nihilist felt something when he saw that horse being whipped in the street in Turin and ran to hug it, surely a numinous experience for him after which he was a lost soul. Um, yeah, I don't know what, I don't remember that incident, Thomas, but um, so I don't know how it would have affected him. Uh, Upalori Krishnamurti says, when Nietzsche said God is dead, didn't he continue with the phrase, and we killed him? meaning that we he had hope for a spiritual meaning but human nature in his materialistic ways have denied god um well i think he also meant um that through the scientific method we had proven um, the lie of christian myth since uh, the beginning of the 16th century and um, and the point is and Dr. Young explains it to us in paragraph 752 of Answer to Job where he says every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche it's not a statement of the physis it's not a, a part of the physical world and that's where we keep getting lost because we keep thinking that it's supposed to be in the physical world and it's not and so uh, anyway Isaiah says remarkable story you mean my story about the chapel <laughs> the more remarkable one was uh, was uh, the day that I was reading answer to Job and exactly in the right moment, um, the four F-18s flew over my house and it just knocked my socks off. So Mr. Krishnamurti, I, you got held for a minute. Let me see what you said. Why do so many ancient texts condemn masturbation, including the Quran and the Bible? Uh, Okay, I will show, show your statement. Um, and that is a fair question, and it's one of my bugaboo questions, so I will address it. 
Um, I think um, at some level um, we feel some shame about uh, masturbation and then uh, our religious leaders pile on us because they want us to uh, use our testosterone and our manhood to go out and kill other people. And, um, and you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's one of these questions of good and evil. Um, you know, if you, if you feel as a man, you know, I'm 72 years old and, and uh, I have uh, sexual urges still and much more than I had expected that I would at this age. Um, and, you know, you can either um, demand that a woman fulfill your needs and maybe she has some needs too. Um, or, um, you know, you can make a conscious decision that um, you will take care of your own needs um, because it's not right to force uh, those needs on someone else when they don't have matching needs anymore or whatever. Um, and, you know, I think these are personal questions but I don't think it's, number one, I don't think it's physically bad for you. Uh, in fact, I think it keeps you young. I think it keeps me young. And I actually have some experience with this. <laughs> and so um, I think the old saying, use it or lose it, makes a lot of sense. And the question is, um, how do you, what do you, do to use it in a way that is not um, destructive either of your marriage or of society in general um, or of your respect for women, uh, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, these are shadow side elements that are normal. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I love your comment here. I'm going to show this too. Um, yeah, it might. <laughs> Mr. Krishnamurti says masturbation keeps you young. Uh, I, <clears throat> I certainly believe that. And I think that I, when I was younger, I was certainly guilt tripped quite a lot about it. Um, maybe not by others. Uh, explicitly, but there was an implication throughout um, society that, you know, this was bad or this was bad for you or you wouldn't be able to have children if you did this and that sort of thing. And that's, I think that's a bunch of hogwash. And given my um, life experience now, I think I can say affirmatively that it is. Grenade says, I can say too much masturbation might desensitize someone, but not enough will be bad too. Um, well, uh, Grenade, I'm 72, and so far, so good. That's all I can say. So, <laughs> uh, FK says, the philosopher Diogenes, the cynic, was accused of masturbation in public. He didn't deny it, but said it would be great if he could rub his stomach when he was hungry. <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is one of those things that men have to face um, certain aspects of our instinctual nature. And most of us are left alone to deal with it and be neurotic about it and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, I was in Vietnam for nine months and, you know, I never 
touched a woman for nine months and um, you know what do you think <laughs> I'm not going to tell you all my shadow stories, but my God, um, you know, use a little common sense and and don't destroy the society as you do it. That's you know the, these. This is one of these issues of um, the decision between good and evil, and certainly there is evil in, within uh, the pornography industry. Um, and, uh, certainly when I wrote my novel, I kept it in a drawer for 21 years because, uh, it contained, well, certainly erotic, but honestly more pornographic chapters in it. And, um, uh, what I do know is that when I was publishing, when I was first publishing it online in 1993, I was publishing it uh, just on, it was before the World Wide Web really got going. So I was publishing it on an email network and I was sending it out uh, to various people through, through email and at, Ultimately, it was read by over a hundred thousand people, <laughs> and uh, it hasn't been read by any anywhere near that number since it's been on Amazon. But, um, but anyway, um, yeah, we grow up with internet porn, and you know, women like to do that sort of thing too and uh, the question is are they being exploited or not and that's an issue that you have to f face and, and work with um, and I agree with you entirely that ballerinas were uh, 400 years ago certainly uh, all you have to do is go to a ballet and you see how um, middle Europeans were getting their rocks off <laughs> in the old days <laughs> and, and selling it as high culture. Um, so, uh, where can you find the book? The book is, uh, for free in electronic form on our Dropbox, uh, but it is called, uh, Mako Memoirs a woman and um, this was one of my experiences with psychic entities so um, it's very related to this uh, Bernard says internet porn is a bit more desensitizing in my book uh, a super stimulus uh, ballerinas are not so much okay I mean everybody has a different perspective um, and you know I don't uh, I don't condone um, abusing or misusing women uh, for pornography uh, but on the other hand if uh, they voluntarily choose to participate that's okay with me because um, one of the one of the archetypes of being a woman uh, is uh, Aphrodite and that is um, uh, an archetype of display and so um, Aphrodite emerges from the water with um, fog around it, fog and foam around her body and and she's quite lovely and of course uh, uh, let's see there's the old drinking song and I'll apologize in advance uh, to any women who are offended by this but it's it's uh, 
it's a pretty old drinking song now, so I think it's in the mainstream. Uh, so here's to the girl who steals a kiss and stays and runs to tell her mother. Here's to a girl who steals a kiss and runs to it. Uh, tell her mother she's a foolish foolish thing she's a foolish foolish thing she's a foolish foolish thing for she'll not get another here's to the girl who steals a kiss and stays to steal another here's to the girl who steals a kiss and stays to steal another she's a boon to all mankind she's a boon to all mankind she's a boon to all mankind for she'll soon be a mother and so uh, that's the way we are as human beings and the first thing we need to do is to uh, face the reality of our shadow and how we deal with these issues. Krishnamurti says, my 24 year old son wants to start smoking cigarettes. I know it's injurious to our health. I quit after 12 years, but I also want him to experience life and figure out things by himself. I'm conflicted. Well, um, <clears throat> you know, he might get away with it. Um, my father smoked cigarettes for 60 years, and um, he died at the age of 83. Uh, but uh, for the last 15 years of his life, he was attached to oxygen. And so I would suggest that you, can, you know, when, when you have a, a psychic experience that's a real experience and so you might <coughs> um, find a way to uh, show your son the other end of the um, the other end of the story the the getting off cigarettes or the early death due to lung cancer and so on in my case, I never was tempted to smoke because my father and mother were smoking so much. When, when I was a baby, my father was smoking two packs a day. Um, it was post-World War II, and, and all the military guys were smoking, and they were smoking the hard stuff, you know, the camels without filters, etc. Um, and... When I was two years old, I had a serious case of asthma, and my father had to spend three years on the Mojave Desert because of that, and we, we were transferred to the Naval Ordnance Testing Station at Inyo Kern, Inyo California, when we spent three years in the high desert, and <clears throat> that cured my asthma, but... Uh, you know, I, I still suffer from it as you hear me uh, clearing my throat and so on. Um, I still have the repercussions of that. My father died uh, 12 years ago, but he hadn't smoked for, for many years, not in my presence anyway. But, and I have never been tempted because of my asthmatic uh, condition, but I, you know, people it can be quite offensive and it also will limit uh, choice of spouses I think uh, this is for now I told him that he should not and my wife agrees but part of me reminds me of myself when I wanted to smoke cigarettes and was allowed to as it was sort of rite of passage back in the 70s uh, geez, I don't remember that rite of passage. I mean, there were a lot of people smoking around me. Uh, I was in the Marine Corps after all. Uh, but um, you know, you you have to let your children go. Ultimately, you have to let them go, and they have to make their own life. But. Um, You know there are there are consequences to to doing bad things. I mean, um, none of us have ever experienced bubonic plague, but um, you know, it, because we haven't experienced it, doesn't mean we should. 
and we're certainly not going to bring rats into our cities in the in the numbers that they were in cities in Western Europe in the um, you know, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries. And, um, and as you know, there was an outbreak of bubonic plague in, in India only uh, about 20 years ago. I ran into it a number of times. And, um, and so just because you haven't tried something doesn't mean you should. I mean, my, my mother was, was uh, a very take-it-as-it-comes sort of person. And um, when she was told that she had pancreatic cancer, uh, she said, oh, okay, well, I haven't experienced pancreatic cancer yet. And she died about four months later, but... Uh, she took it as as an experience of life toward her wholeness and um, and in a way that served her well as she, as her end of her life came along um, but you know in the end uh, you can't protect your children and so you can tell them stories you can take them to movies about people who die from cigarettes or what have you but you you know what um, in the end they're going to make their own decisions and you know a lot of people regret those decisions later later on uh, so peace to our aurora and we are 15 minutes over time so i think i better call this to a halt and next week I will do something about Anne Ulanoff's books because I think that they're so profound about what she was saying. And so thank you for joining me tonight. And I will put this, uh, the replay of this online very shortly. Uh, YouTube always sets it for uh, unlisted to begin with. And so I always have to go in and, and change that. But anyway, uh, it will be available for replay later on. Um, and Renette says, you're lucky he even told you. I wouldn't have told my mom I had started smoking. Um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least you can think in terms of an intervention, but <clears throat> obviously I think that there are many more uh, much worse things out there in society right now, this opioid epidemic. My understanding is that it killed 62,000 people last year, so that's 4,000 more than were killed in the entire Vietnam War. And in my case, uh, I've had two people in my close community die from the opioid epidemic. Uh, one is my brother-in-law's son, and one is the son of a dear friend. And so, um, you know, I think that we, as parents, do have to intervene if we can and find ways to uh, save our children uh, from that kind of thing. And it's not pretty. Um, but anyway. Um, so Gerdad says, I saw someone nodding off on the train tonight, not abnormal, from heroin. Um, well, that person is probably lost. I, I don't imagine that you can save them. Um, but you can save yourself and you can save those who haven't uh, gotten to that stage of addiction. Um, and I think all of us have that responsibility uh, to try to do that. And we ought to take that responsibility. And if, if that becomes a meaning of your life, that's a valuable meaning to your life, to save someone's life that way. Um, so anyway, peace.
I'm going to sign off. I'll see you next week. Oh, by the way, actually, I won't be doing the Olin off next week because next week we're having our uh, monthly meeting at Sam, uh, Sammy's Pizza Kitchen with our local group. And so there will be a session online, but it will be a session um, that will be a round robin uh, with uh, my various local friends and you too, because I uh, was able last time to get the iPad up so I could follow the chat, which I will endeavor to do. And probably we will uh, next week uh, work on young quotes. Uh, and so if you have any particular quotes you would like to um, have us discuss, um, please send them to me. It's better if you send them in advance, but uh, we can try it. We can hope that you can also put them onto the chat. So anyway, peace. Take care now. Bye.